Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bible, if you would, and join me today in Genesis chapter 39, Genesis chapter number 39. There are few poems that I have put to memory. There's one that I know fairly well, certainly not beyond the ability to make a mistake, but one that I have learned and retained. You've probably heard me quote it before, so if you would humor me once again, let me say one of the few poems that I have put to memory. It goes like this. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and not a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. There are lessons that certainly a Christian can learn in times of ease or times of pleasure or joy, but I suspect that your experience may mirror that of so many in Scripture and and of those around us. I suspect that your experience may be that you have learned more in the school of affliction than you have in the school of comfort and ease. Today, we're actually going to look at the school that Joseph seemed to be attending. It's called the school of affliction, and it is one that was designed by God for Joseph's good. We remember that Joseph is this continual picture of Jesus Christ. We see Christ everywhere in the life of Joseph. And he was about to enter a time of incredible importance. And this time of learning is Incidentally, it's going to last for years. Some believe that it would have lasted for at least seven years. Most think that Joseph was in this school of affliction, and by that I mean specifically the prison house, that he's there for at least 10 years, and some believe he may well have been there upwards of 13 years in this school, so to speak, of affliction. Why there? Why this school? Well, again, because God had something good in store for Joseph and because Joseph becomes for us this powerful early picture of Jesus Christ. Think about what the Bible says regarding Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 8, these words regarding Christ. Though he, Jesus, were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. When we read those words, Jesus Christ, God in human form, learning obedience by the things which he suffered, it seems to have this paradoxical, you know, uh, uh, collision in our mind. It's like, how in the world can this truly be? But when we start to think about what it is that this all-wise, all-knowing, omniscient God, the person of Jesus Christ, learning something, the word learned here is applied in this way. It means that he learned by experience and use. He didn't learn something new that he didn't know before, but rather he has now entered into our experience, the experience of our suffering. If Christ was the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, if Christ was not spared from suffering, why do at times I presume that I should be spared? Christ, our forerunner, the one who said, follow in my footsteps, learned through suffering. So often God may in his good plan for your life and for mine, Enroll us in the school of suffering so that we too can learn to be like Jesus Christ. 
Well, your Bibles are open to Genesis chapter 39. Let's revisit the account and the events that Joseph is facing at this stage, this point in his life. Verse number 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison house, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in prison. But notice again these words, verse number 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. Hey, back up to the early part of the chapter, chapter 39, verse number one. Joseph, now he goes from Potiphar's house to the prison house. But remember that when he left his father's house to be sold into Potiphar's house, something happened. Look again, verse number one, the first few words, Genesis 39. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And look at verse number two. And the Lord was with Joseph. You and I should never think that because our circumstances around us are hostile, that God has left us to our own devices. I don't know what the circumstances of your life have been this last week, but I would be foolish to think that in a crowd this size, there are those who simply had, that all of us simply had one of those storybook adventure lives where everything just unfolded exactly as was pleasing to us. I mean, what were your circumstances this past week? Were those things, those things that like, wow, it announced some calamity or it just, it came upon you with this blast of unexpected suddenness. It's like, God, what am I facing and why now and why me? Please do not think that God has left you to your own devices. Joseph is, is taken into the land of Egypt. He go, goes from a place of favor to a place of slavery and he finds that the Lord is with him. The Lord's with him in Potiphar's house and he's lied about. And by the way, another picture of Christ briefly stated is the Bible makes no clear uh, uh, detail of Joseph's defense. I mean, jo Joseph could well have said, you know my character, you know how I have conducted myself, you know Potiphar that I've only done that which is good to you. And Potiphar, you know your wife, I did not do this. But as the, the lamb before its shears is dumb or silent, so Jesus opened not his mouth. And Joseph opens not his. He, he makes no defense. And now he is cast into the prison. And again, the Bible reveals to us that just as he was with him in Potiphar's house, he's with him in prison. The Lord was with Joseph. So what is it that we're going to see? We've seen the tests that Joseph has to pass. Now let's look at the school of affliction and the lessons learned in such or said school. The first lesson that I see that Joseph learns in the school of affliction, and by the way, I don't know, certainly God knew, but I don't know that Joseph could have learned this anywhere else but enrolled in this school. Lesson learned first he would learn that God's delays are not God's denials. Let me say it again. He would learn that God's delays are not God's denials. Look at chapter 40, Genesis chapter 40. Let's pick it up in verse number one. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. Okay, now Joseph, remember, he's given charge over the prison and, of course, over these prisoners. Now, notice what happens through the course of time. These are just events that are unfolding. Look at verse number five. Here the Bible says, and they dreamed a dream, both of them. Each man had his dream, or each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in prison. Well, they both go to sleep one night, and they have these dreams, and, and how many of you have had vivid dreams? You don't have to raise your hand, and, and uh, don't disturb someone if they're having one right now, but, but maybe you have, that's not funny, just in case you're wondering, okay. <laughs> So maybe you have, you know, pillowed your head and you had this vivid dream and you awoke from your dream and it's like, wow, that was as clear as if it were real. Now, often you have a dream and it's kind of fuzzy or, 
or distant and you remember pieces or parts. But every now and then there's a dream that is just so clear. These guys woke from their dream and they had details regarding the dream. Joseph comes in and he sees that their countenance has fallen. He can tell that they're sad. And he says, why are you troubled? What's going on? And they said, we had a really strange dream last night. Now, the kindness that Joseph is about to show is going to be really interesting. Look down at verse number 14. He interprets the butler's dream. We won't take time to detail all that took place with the dream, but he interprets the dream. Look at verse number 14. He says, but think on me when it shall be well with thee and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me and make mention of me unto Pharaoh and bring me out of this house. The kindness that Joseph showed to the butler by interpreting the dream was not returned again in a timely fashion to Joseph. I think we'll see some lessons that Joseph learns even from this a little bit later in, in our look into his life, but it just simply was not returned. I suspect that at this point, Joseph has been in prison for multiple years. He's increased in favor. He's at the point now where the keeper of the prison really has no responsibility because he has translated all of that responsibility onto the shoulders of Joseph. Joseph is the guy that's running the prison. And now he's looking for an opportunity to be released. So he says to this butler, he says, listen, would you remember me to Pharaoh? When you come into the house, because you are, remember me. Genesis 40, verse number 21. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Verse 23. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. God's delays are on purpose. This is a mental quandary to us. We often wonder why others receive the blessings that we feel we so desperately need. It is quite possible that God is offering us an opportunity to actually live by faith and not by sight. Because when God delays, it is only our faith. Let me say this again, and please don't miss it. When God delays, it is only our faith and not our circumstances that sustains us and gives us hope. Why do you need faith when your circumstances have all been arranged? Why do we need faith when the road before us is clearly marked and clearly seen and, and it's not strewn with obstacle and difficulty? Why do I need faith when the path seems rather rosy? But when God delays, when the prison is still our address, and, and by the way, there are all kinds of prisons. There are prisons of sometimes just mental frustration, uncertainty, anxiety, Lord, when are you going to release me from this prison? At times, there are simply the prison of circumstances. We say, Lord, I have prayed, I have wept, I have offered, I have pleaded. When, oh God? Do you know there is something that is necessarily connected to faith when whatever prison you're facing, is, the key is not immediately handed to you and there is no key in sight. What God may be doing is God may be saying, you are going to learn to trust me even when I appear to delay. This is the message all throughout Scripture, and certainly it's easy to see in the book of Psalms. Listen, when we start to think about, about David's pleas before God, they could have easily have been written by the, the hand, the pen of Joseph, as they could have the hand of David. Psalm 25, verse 21, let integrity and uprightness preserve me. For I wait on thee. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall, future tense, he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 37, 7, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Psalm 37, 9, for the evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Psalm 38, 15, for in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord, my God. 
Psalm 59, 9, because of his strength will I wait upon thee, for God is my defense. Psalm 62, 5, my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Do you know what the psalmist just keeps saying repeatedly? He keeps saying, there is coming a day when I will no longer have to wait. He keeps processing this in future tense. He shall, he will, the day is coming. Can't you hear Joseph just say over and over again, Lord, I pray that it's today, but if it is not today, my faith remains intact. I will wait upon you. Are there certain phone calls you're waiting for? Certain conversations that you desire to be unfolded? Certain steps that you are so praying to see finally taken? Is, is there something that is in front of you and you say, oh, Lord, how long? And the Lord says, wait. God's delays are not to be considered God's denials. How is it that we continually, we can continually stand and say, my hope is in the Lord? Joseph's learning that his delays are not his denials and his plans are not disturbed. Certainly, just as in Joseph's ear, often in our own ear, we hear Satan whisper the words, now what about your God? What kind of God would reward integrity and righteousness and moral purity with prison? If this is what serving God is like, I would cash out now and find another God. How do you answer that whisper in your ear? You answer it like this. You answer it with, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Do you know who you've believed? If you know upon whom your faith is resting, then you will also conclude that God's delays are not God's denials. God never delays for reasons that are in any way diabolical. His delays are deliberate and they will actually lead to some future deliverance and eventual delight. While we should not pretend to think we know all the reasons why God may delay, we can know that there are reasons that are purposeful and even good. I love Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 18. Isaiah 30, 18, it's one of those verses, those passages of scripture that if you are a person who marks in your Bible, if you have little references that oftentimes in the back of your Bible you take note of, because man, I know I'm gonna need this. And therefore, will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto thee? And therefore, will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you? For the Lord is a God of judgment, Blessed are all they that wait for him. Do you hear what he's saying? The Lord waits, not for any arbitrary, capricious, you know, diabolical reason. The Lord delays. He waits. Why? Because he wants to be gracious unto you. And then that same passage concludes with, blessed are all they that wait for him. Lord, I know you're waiting for a good reason. And I am going to wait now upon you. For God to have acted a moment earlier for Joseph would have meant something less than God's best. He clearly was not forgotten in the dungeon. He was actually being favored. Okay, so let's see how even in the dungeon, a guy like Joseph finds God's favor. You know, the first thing we learn is his delays are not his denials. But let's look a little bit further. The second thing that Joseph has to learn in the school of affliction is this. He would learn that God doesn't depart even when you're in the dungeon. You say, well, I've kind of already concluded that. Let's look at it a little bit further. Genesis 39, verse 21. Genesis 39, verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. When the Lord says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, Hebrews 13, 5, it does mean that it includes even your most challenging times of life. I think it's why we take such comfort in things like Psalm 23, where we're talking about even in the shadow of death, 
the valley of the shadow of death. Thou art with me. Thou, you, God, even in the valley, you are with me. Remember, outward prosperity is no exclusive indication of God's presence or his pleasure. I want to remind us of that again. It is very easy for us to look at other people. It's easy for us to look at buildings or ministries. It's easy for us to look circumstantially. It's easy for us to look around and we say, well, surely they have the pleasure and the blessing of God. It's not to say that, that, that physical blessing is not God's blessing, but it is not exclusively an indicator. It's really important for us to note that. Sometimes we can get a little askew in our vision when we start looking at other people and we say, wow, they have, they have every blessing imaginable. Listen, we may not know the half of the story. These are not purely indicators of God's pleasure or his blessing. This would be a, a fitting a, a application, illustration. Dr. Zacharias is a cancer survivor. He heard the words, you have cancer. And then he also heard the words, well, we believe right now you are cancer-free. So both of those were your experiences. Okay, when is it easier to say God is good? When he heard the words, you have cancer. And he goes and he tells the body of believers that surround him. Uh, What's the word from the doctor? I was told I have cancer. Do you know how how rarely we come with the words? And I'm not saying he did or didn't, but I I know what my tendency might be. Do you know how rare it is that our first words are, oh, but God's been good. We tend to, when we finally get the word, you're cancer free. Hey, guess what I just heard? I'm cancer free. God has been so good. Is God just as good to Joseph in the prison as he is on the throne of Pharaoh? If God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then his goodness does not change um, with the fluctuation of our circumstances. God is exclusively good. Yes, God is good when you get the deal on the house. He's good when you get the promotion at work, when the words cancer-free come from the lab. He's good when you have the fellowship of family walking with God. He's good when the answer to prayer about a restored friendship has finally happened. But his goodness is none diminished when the deal on the house falls through. His goodness is not lessened when someone else gets your promotion at work. He's good when the lab results come back and you hear the words, you have cancer. He's good when a family member rejects him. He is good when your friendship is still broken and unrestored. And knowing that God sent Joseph to prison, why would we expect God to leave him or his goodness to forsake him? If goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life, That is not exclusive of the prison house. What is Joseph learning? He's learning that God doesn't depart, nor does his goodness, even in the dungeon. Let me ask this question and and pause and think about it. There really are, in a sense, two correct answers. Was it Joseph's brothers who sent him to Egypt or God? We might conclude that it really is not an either-or question. Was it Potiphar that sent Joseph to prison? Or was it God? Was it Pharaoh that sent Joseph to the throne? Or was it God? Consider Psalm 105. Listen to what the Bible says, Psalm 105, beginning in verse number 17, detailing the journeys of God's people and Joseph in particular. Listen to the first he and you deduce who is it that we're talking about. In Psalm 105, beginning in verse number 17, he sent a man before them. Who is this? We're talking about God. He, God, sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came and the word of the Lord tried him. Who sent Joseph to Egypt? 
Well, the Bible in Psalm 105 says God sent someone before his people into Egypt. So does that mean that Joseph's brothers, they kind of just skipped through life because, well, it was, it was God actually that sent Joseph to prison. God, you know, he had a good plan. Certainly he did, but it does none release the brothers who sold their brother into slavery. Their responsibility remains intact. And yet, isn't it incredible how God can take the circumstances of man, even the evil choices of mankind, and use it for our good and ultimately for his glory? Well, the word tried, God just said, I'm refining him. He tried him there. The word of the Lord tried him. The word of the Lord, even in shackles, it does something of good, refinement for Joseph. Even in the prison, Joseph's education was growing and deepening exponentially. And if God has you in some type of difficult circumstance right now, one not of your choosing, but of God's knowing, then understand that he is always up to something good in your life. In Romans 5, 3 and 4, it says, But we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. He's saying tribulation, your school of affliction, it's going to do something good for you. He says it worketh patience. That means endurance, steadfastness, perseverance, the ability to stand. It's that thing that allows your roots to go, grow deep so that when the storms of life blast you, the tree stands strong. It worketh patience and then patience experience. Experience that's character that's been tried and proven. You've seen God's faithfulness in your past. You anticipate and expect his faithfulness in your future. And experience works hope. Hope is the confident expectation that God is working all things together for our good. David has a little conversation with himself. I, I love it when he does this. I, I read it all the time in Psalms. David has this conversation and he says in Psalm 42, 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? He's talking to himself. Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. In the prison, Joseph learned that God's presence was to be, to be preferred to some prosperous course in life. He said, Lord, I'll choose your presence. In Psalm 51.11, we could hear Joseph almost pray the words of David. David said, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Let me ask you another question. If you were offered this, whatever prison it is that you're facing, whatever prison you may be in right now, if you were offered release from your prison at the expense of the presence of God, what would you take? See, I think Joseph had already answered that question. Cast me not away from thy presence. Lord, if prison is where I can have your presence, then God, I willingly submit to prison. I choose you over the ease of circumstance. I choose you even if that means the prison house rather than Pharaoh's house. Oh, I'm not saying he shouldn't pray for Pharaoh's house, but I do believe he would choose God's presence over any other palace that Joseph could be offered. Look at the next lesson that Joseph learns in prison. Well, he, he learns next that just as he was granted mercy, he too should be the giver of the same. This is going to be an important lesson for Joseph. And he doesn't, if he doesn't get it in prison, he may not ever get it. Joseph learns that just as he was granted mercy, he should be the giver of the same. Look again, Genesis 39, verse 21. The Lord was with Joseph. He showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison, even in the prison house. Joseph understands, I'm receiving something good here that I didn't earn on my own behalf. You can never get to the point where you deserve mercy. Don't ever plead with God on the fact that, God, look at what I've done to finally garner your mercy. 
The Bible says that God takes pleasure in those that hope in his mercy. They recognize, God, this is part of your character, your nature. I'm I'm banking on the fact that I know who you are. And so, God, I am hoping in your mercy. Not because you've earned it, but because he is it. Well, what is Joseph learning? He's learning that just as he was granted mercy, he's going to be one who can offer it as well. And notice just two other brief lessons that Joseph learns. He learned that glory belongs to God. Glory belongs to God. Look at verse number eight in Genesis chapter 40. And they said unto him, we have dreamed a dream and there's no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, now pause just a moment. Okay, what would you have said? (laughs) They dream these dreams. These guys are in the presence of Pharaoh wow, this this could be my ticket out. Hey, I could ride in on their coattails. Maybe they could find something for me. I'll I'll work in the kitchen. I'll I'll help the butler. Maybe there's a place for me. Uh, Guys, I might be able to help you out here. Uh, What's your problem? But Joseph doesn't do that. Joseph realizes glory belongs exclusively to God. And he begins his conversation by deflecting praise and saying, hey guys, just so you tell me your dreams, but please know that this, whatever happens, it belongs exclusively to God. The Bible um, uh, says in Genesis chapter 41, verses 15 and 16, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream and there's none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, you know what he did? He repeated a lesson. He had learned it in the prison house and now he owns it in Pharaoh's house. So how does he respond? With something that he learned in school. He just now repeats to him and Joseph answered Pharaoh, verse number 16, saying, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. If Joseph doesn't learn that lesson of God's glory In the prison, he certainly would have forgotten it in the throne of Egypt. Lastly, he learned to leave his confidence exclusively in God. He learned to leave his confidence exclusively in God. Remember in verse number 14 in chapter 40, he says, But think on me when it shall be well with thee. And show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. While it may have been appropriate for Joseph to ask the butler to remember him, ultimately, it would be God, not the butler, that would deliver him. In, in you know, chapter 40, verse 21, and he restored the chief butler under his butlership again. Then look at verse number 23. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Please hear this. If your confidence is in men, your life will become fertile ground for disappointment and eventual bitterness. I want to say that again, and I don't want to just brush over it. If your confidence is in a person, your life becomes very fertile ground for resentment, disappointment, and eventual bitterness. Because I don't care who you look at, if you look closely enough, just looking at men, you're going to find something to be disappointed in. Something. Well, I know God's preserved a picture in the life of Joseph that is pristine. But that, I think, is because Joseph becomes this this really early picture of Jesus in whom there is no spot or blemish. But you look closely enough at me. Oh. Look closely enough in the mirror. Oh. Do you know one of the things that Joseph had to learn is my confidence is not in men. My confidence is in God. Regrettably, I'm going to say this to all of us here and and to an audience that often joins us by way of television. So many times people look to pastors or Christian leaders to be their confidence. And sadly, too many pastors have set themselves up as the ones to whom all people are to look. Pastors 
just like all others, are to point people to the one that will never disappoint, the one in whom we can all have complete, absolute confidence. In Psalm 118, verse number eight, the Bible says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. That's no excuse. No pastor should, should have an excuse and say, well, you shouldn't have been looking so closely. That's not an excuse. It's just the reality that there is one who will never disappoint. And if your eyes are fixed on him, they are fixed on the right person. Joseph's realization that men had failed him repeatedly was a good realization. Yet his life was not filled with bitterness or regret. He did not daily rehearse the injustices done to him. He patiently rested in the one in whom his confidence remained unshaken. What does he learn? He learns in the school of affliction not to place his confidence in men, but to put his trust in the Lord, his God. Joseph learned a lot in the school of affliction. He learned that God's delays are not always God's denials. He would learn that God doesn't depart even when you're in the dungeon. He learned that as he was granted mercy, he could be the giver of the same. He learned that all glory belongs to God. And he learned to leave his confidence in the right place. Not by trusting in men, but placing his confidence in the Lord, his God. Joseph learned some good lessons in the school of affliction. I wonder if maybe God may also be teaching you. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.